Okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, can't we agree agree to substitute uh, Stuart Jitten Bastel uh, Basten uh, uh, who could not uh, make it? So can you share the screen, uh, Raya? Yes, let's do that. Um, keep on making my PowerPoint screen. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you should think many screen opening. Uh, where is it? So, uh, Here, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And just to, yeah, just to interrupt me if somehow my sound goes away or something. <laughs> okay. Case. Thank you. And yeah, and I guess I'm in between uh, you and the lunch break, so I also try to be brief. And thanks for the introduction. And as uh, Jacopo said, so I I jumped jump in um, on behalf of, of Stuart, who with personal circumstance cannot cannot come in person, so and I have to join from uh, from Bologna actually, so not so far from three FC, but still I shouldn't come in person. Um, so it's sort of um, the reason why I kind of jump in because me and Stuart, who is Stuart Baston, is an expert on fertility. Uh, so he's a demographer, so I myself am a demographer too, but my main work is I mainly work on the relationship between population and the environment or on climate change, but truly I look at the impact of climate change on different um, outcomes such as malnutrition, migration, health, and, and so on. And, um, and recently, uh, my interest is also on wondering whether climate change would have some impact or some relationship to this facility. So Stuart and I, we haven't really quite started our collaboration yet, but the idea is there on the table. Um, so I guess to, 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 bring, um, to bring you with some idea on, on, on why fertility may be linked with climate change. So I thought uh, thinking about the broader relationship, why population is related to climate change may be a useful concept. So um, in this figure, as you can see, so from the left-hand side, it's about how human activities, how our production and consumption, the way we use transportation, the way we consume food, contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and, and then to global warming or climate change. So that's one relationship. So pretty much people tend to talk about uh, population size or sometimes the, the differences within the population and how composition, distribution, and how that affect climate change on the one side. Um, on another side, um, I'm not sure how hot Trieste is, but we know that uh, this year we have experienced early heat waves in South Asia, in Europe in, in June, and, and also currently North America uh, is also experiencing heat waves, which is quite, um, it's not unprecedented, but it came in earlier in the climate scientists also have done some calculation and show that these heat waves that we are experiencing are also attributable to human-made climate change. So in fact, um, we are already experiencing climate change. So it's not something anymore distant in the future or distant in terms of uh, geographical distance far away from Europe. We are experiencing it right now. Um, so one could also already started observing the impact of climate change on different type of on health and well-being and different types of outcomes. So in, um, in this heat wave in, in Europe, someone already did a calculation that it at least uh, led to um, about 1,500 excess mortality from this particular heat wave alone. Um, so it does affect our health and mortality. In other type of context, we may think also that um, some extreme climate events like drought, for instance, may affect crop yields, it affects incomes, and it affects the livelihood of people who depend on agriculture. And in some cases, uh, migration may be used as a um, So when we, when we made this figure, actually back in 2017, we were thinking that, yeah, it, um, climate change, um, population dynamic is explained by mortality, fertility, and migration, but maybe climate change doesn't have an effect. On, on fertility, that was back then, but now maybe it's not wrong also to think that apart from other drivers that affect uh, fertility intention, fertility patterns, 
indeed some of the extreme climate events that we're experiencing or that people um, understand or perceive may also affect the PDP. So that's, that's, that's the idea of the link. Um, let's come back to, to another side. That's why uh, fertility matters for, for climate change because fertility is one driver of cooperation. Okay? So this equation is, is, is criticized a lot, but it, it gives you some kind of the simple um, relationship between the environmental impact and population. So environmental impact is a function of population, affluence, which is typically measured by GDP, and technology, which is how resource intensive or how efficient the, 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 um, the, 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 um, the technology that we have per, per, per unit of, of consumption. Um, if you plug this equation and use the kind of, sort of the empirical data to measure, yes, population does play a role. Um, but probably one of the factors that explain better or have more weight in terms of rental impact is absence. It's GDP. We know that the um, consumption of carbon emissions uh, varies greatly by, by, by the level of income. Still, population is one component. Um, and I think many of you have attended the talk of Andrew June yesterday that she was talking about uh, population changes and future population. Um, so since population plays a role, though maybe not as much as GDP in terms of environmental impact, but still how many people are there going to be in the future would also to a certain extent determine uh, the human impact on climate change. So how climate change scenarios would unfold would to a certain extent depend also on how many people are we going to have and also who are we going to have in the, in the population. So um, why now why why fertility matters is that we to understand the future population size we need to know three things right because there are three demographic components that determine uh, population change so one is fertility if we know uh, the number of women in say in time t the women of reproductive age in time t typically in the five year time period that we do projection in time T plus five, let's say, uh, even of reproductive age, we, we kind of can, can project how many number of, of children are gonna be in the time period. A similar thing, um, mortality is also to understand population change. So people were born, people die. It's, uh, it's also another component which is important for understanding population change. And of course, migration, people who move in and move out uh, 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 in a certain phase or certain country. So typically, um, so we need to understand three things to understand the future population. Mortality and migration tend to be um, the important driver of the slightly more short-term population change because it fluctuates. Uh, one good example is mortality, for instance, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is a more or less unprecedented shock that led to, uh, in certain uh, context, in certain time period before the vaccination, for instance, so it did lead to a higher number of, of excess mortality, which is unprecedented. It can, in the short term period, change also the population size of, of, of in a short period. But for the important long-term, medium to long-term driver, it is the PDP that matters a lot. And um, that brings back into the idea of why fertility, since fertility is one of the key driver of the future population and um, how many people are we going to have in the future, linking it with the concept of environment or resources. So, um, how many people are going to be? It uh, people may may grow, may increase um, exponentially, but we have the limit in terms of the land that we have. We have the limit in terms of water that we have, or the, the amount of food that we have. So the, the idea that people started talking about is how many people, how many are going to be, and is there a limit in in, in the uh, space or the capacity that the earth can support population. So that's sort of now when when um, non-demographers talk about uh, population and climate change, it's sort of the idea of the, the mouse um, uh, idea concept of exponential population growth, but food doesn't 
grow um, as far as the population grows, sort of it, it sort of come back in the literature right now, but tend to tend to come out from, from non demographer when we when people talk about the relationship between population and climate change. Um, so sort of, uh, and, and as I was saying, that fertility is one key medium to long term driver of future population. So the idea of um, thinking about overpopulation, population control, family planning, um, it, it was unpopular, but it sort of started coming back again on the, on the agenda, on the sustainable development agenda as well. Um, now that, 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 that the impact of climate change has become more severe. Um, and I think you, you I think many of you have, have attended Anne's talk also yesterday. Uh, I think her talk focused a bit more on population aging. So sort of, so we, we also, when we think about global population, so we're talking about the world of, on the one hand, that's one side of, of the societies, which probably um, are trying to deal with low fertility, population aging, or maybe declining number of population on the one hand. And um, when the West sometimes in the, the narrative, when, when, when they talk about uh, the population impact on climate change, which I was saying already that people maybe from poorer region are not consumed as much, but they have higher population growth. So on the other hand, the issues of, of overpopulation also tend to be on, on the agenda. So the sort of the population policies can also go in two directions, right? For sort of addressing lower population and also higher population. So recently there has been one study that's trying to put on the table the idea that, well, actually if we reduce the number of children, it may indeed really save the carbon footprint. So they they, they, they did some of the calculations showing that um, we can do many things to reduce our, our carbon footprint. Many of the activities we do, uh, we can try to use electric car, for instance, uh, we can eat plant-based diet, and this would uh, reduce uh, the, the carbon emissions that, that we, we do. Uh, by the way, things like recycling or changing the light out the political one do have some impact, but it's a really, really minor one. But they have shown that um, having one fewer child, so one child less, so this is based on the consumption of people in uh, high income countries, or so one, one child would also have higher consumption as well. But anyway, uh, having one fewer child would contribute to reducing about 60 carbon metric ton per year. And just to give you an idea what does uh, one carbon metric ton uh, refers to, so one carbon metric ton is equivalent of 2.5 um, flights from Rome to Amsterdam. So saving 60, that's, that's, that's a lot. And that's per year, that's an annual one. So with this study coming out, um, it's sort of, as I was saying, that the idea of uh, in, in, in the world of demography, the, the talk about population control, population planning, was kind of popular in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and became less popular in the 90s, particularly after the um, International Conference on Population Development in Cairo. The type of narrative would be when we talk about uh, family planning uh, or reproductive health, it's more about that, that um, uh, empowerment of people to achieve the number of fertility that the people want. Um, so sort of giving access, giving empowerment, education, you know, education or access to contraception, but, but not to go and then coerce the family uh, limitation or, or planning. So, so in a way, the message, if, if we send out the message and saying that a hey, high population, if we reduce, we reduce carbon emission, we save climate change, it, can be dangerous because it can come back again to the, the type of practice that, that was done back in the, in terms of uh, reproductive rights in the 70s and 80s. Um, so now the question that one posed, and particularly this is posed by, by, by Stuart, because he, he works a lot on fertility intention, is um, can climate change have a kind of bottom up effect in child bearing? Uh, meaning that um, it's not that 
the policy is to just to limit the population, but maybe um, the experience or the perception about the uh, the danger of climate change, for instance, can indeed can affect the reproductive decision making. Um, so, some of you may have seen so back in 2019, and, and this movement, there's a movement called Birth Strike, it is still ongoing, which is kind of a uh, kind of the sub uh, variation of the extinction rebellion. So, there's a group of women actually led by um, uh, some person in the UK, uh, kind of kind of uh, establishing a movement of not wanting to have kids or children due to ecological crisis. Um, and it seems to be that um, the number of people who, who express uh, this reason, if, if, we, if, 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 if we ask, uh, what's your plan? What's your family plan in the future? Some people may say, I don't plan to have kids and uh, climate change may be put as, a, as one of the reasons. Um, but to understand how this uh, perception that climate change may affect the safety preferences, we, we have to understand also the complexity of the policy decision. So it's not that um, one could also think that you can take the data, take the data on temperature changes, rainfall changes, and look at how people um, respond, how people respond to it. One could do that. But we also know, the more of us know that the uh, fertility decision is more complex than that. Because first of all, it is how a person and individual condition or perception or social norms or culture attitudes can determine um, the belief about having children. That's one thing. And then, um, so not only the belief about having children would, would, uh, would affect uh, fertility intention, but also your socioeconomic or demographic condition, because it, it does, it, it, it depends if, if one really thinks of one want to have children, but maybe if you're un currently unemployed, for instance, in Italy, we also know that the city is rather uh, low, also because maybe people even not cannot afford to leave parents in her home quickly and so on. So your sort of socioeconomic conditions can also determine your, your outcome with fertility. And on top of that, so one may have the, the social norms of, of that moment, one may have the economy crisis and the effect of fertility. On top of that, maybe climate change may affect fertility. So to make to making such a link, empirical link, it's a difficult exercise. That's what I want to say, because so many things determine uh, fertility. Now the question is, um, since we started hearing people Thing is, I don't want children because of, of, of climate change. Can the social norm, which is part of the uh, uh, driver of fertility intention, change in the future? Um, typically, to shy norm is, is, is common, but in some places, for in Pakistan, for instance, for instance it's a full shy uh, norm because of uh, uh, typically if you have experience high mortality and you have some preference, so maybe the norm would be high end. So now, now the question is, is, can it be that way that climate change may affect uh, social norms? Um, there's the studies on this topic, since it's really new, uh, uh, the evidence are scattered. So there's some, for, for instance, the small studies of, of uh, people aged 27 to 45 in the US, 2600. Seven people uh, who, who responded to, to the survey. Um, there are some evidence showing that the majority of people actually expect that they are concerned. So the the, the blue blue line here that they are concerned about the carbon footprint of, of of having children. And in particular, in in in, in the orange bar, people express that they are particularly concerned about that climate impact that children will experience. So we tried it to gather what kind of studies that have done in, in, in this way. But this is the questions that, that, are, that, that, that ask to people about their perception about maybe the concern of environmental concern, what is that be their fertility intention, the link with children. So it's not really measuring the actual number of children that people actually have. So it's only about the perception. Um, and then one could think that perception can translate into the actual behavior, but it's not always. 
100% translation in that way. So the evidence is pretty much mixed, or there's some evidence they found in the Canadian students experienced the subsample. Um, but there's a study by our colleague, Maria Rita Testa, um, using Eurobarometer data with the European, uh, about 30 European countries. Um, they don't find any find interaction with people who express concern about the environment also. Um, First, that they want to have less number of children. So the empirical evidence is still, it, it can be all over the place at the moment. Um, another thing that, that one has to keep in mind is when you ask the people, especially when you ask the young people, what is that, what would be their fertility intention of, or, or, or fertility preference? If you ask someone who's 20 years old, 25, let's say, um, um, regardless of climate change, people would change the way they, they answer the question later on when, when, when they became older or when, when they hit more the, of the reproductive age or, 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 or the, the limit in that reproductive age. So what we don't know, since it's new, then he said, I, I can do the survey, I could ask the young people of today, but then I would have to wait until 10 on the, in, the, in the next 10 or 15 years to see if that expression actually transfer into the actual fertility behavior. So that, that's one important thing to, to keep in mind. I was showing more of the evidence from the low fertility type of countries, but there's a very recent study by a PhD student actually that looked at sub-Saharan African countries. Um, also show, so this study used the, not the perception about climate change, but the experience of temperature changes and precipitation changes. And they found that, um, uh, with the experience of uh, anomalies, so higher temperature than, than the normal reference period, and also higher precipitation, not low with, with uh, rainfall, but, but higher ones, uh, that lead to lower desire family size or lower desire to have additional child, and also delay in the timing of next child. So we can think of different mechanisms, actually, that, that explain why such an, an experience may affect uh, fertility preferences. I would go through this just, just almost at the end of my talk. So I mean, I have three more slides and I would be done. Um, uh, so I was showing more of the, the evidence from the study that look at fertility preference and intention. Uh, there are some studies, not, not many, that, that look at how experience of temperature changes affect so now it's, it's the actual fertility, not the perception. Um, it seems to be, so, so again, we would need more studies, maybe 10 to 15, to be able to say something more concrete. But it seems to be that heat, experience of heat, uh, tends to suppress the fertility. It can be because heat does um, affect fecundity, so the, the ability to, to, to get pregnant. Um, but that, the, the, but the effect, so that's the evidence from the US on the graph on the left hand side. Uh, but some other studies looking at Indonesian data, for instance, showing that it does, it does affect uh, fertility, but only in some subgroup of population. Um, in fact, in the wealthier and better educated women, they experience better intentions to, to have another child. So, so we're still not, not sure yet. What would be the true effect? Maybe we can think that highly educated people can adapt better to climate change or influence, and that doesn't affect so much their, their, their fertility. Um, so, uh, this is the, the last slide to, uh, to the last, <laughs> to the slide before the last one. Uh, so, what do fertility patterns look like under climate change? Um, theoretically, so this is theoretical, theoretically. Uh, it can increase fertility. For instance, if one thinks that um, if you experience climate change, you would need to uh, increase your income. If you're in a farming household, for instance, you may need an extra shy labor. So if having children can be in a labor asset, then perhaps you can increase. Or there are some practice of what we call fertility replacement. So Typically, after experience of, of shy mortality, maybe due to uh, certain natural disasters like earthquake and tsunamis, it has been found that the field is as a reaction when you lost your shy. Or if you 
it's called um, it, or the hoarding effect. So if you foresee that infant mortality or child mortality would be high, you may overcompensate by having more uh, um, number of children. I kind of think, uh, so it's still the world that we still have to, to start tracking the data. I think that uh, at least in, in the next five to 10 years, there are also other changes that affect fertility. Climate change may have negative consequences on fertility based on two kind of uh, channels. The physiological effects, as I was saying, uh, earlier that that's some evidence pointing out that uh, extreme hot temperature can affect fecundity. So that's kind of almost direct effect on the physiological condition. Or it, it also, uh, with, with changes in urine flow pattern, it can increase the risk of mal malaria infection and that can affect the maternal health. Or it can go indirectly, such as um, food security, Reduction in crop use affects food security, affects the nutritional status of mother, and that again can affect uh, the reproductive health. That's a kind of indirect effect climate change. So it may lead to negative consequences on fertility. And then we have the birth right type of uh, arguments, the psychosocial effect, the concerns about climate change in two sides, right? So you may not want to have children because you are concerned about the human impact on the global climate system emissions. Or you're concerned about not wanting to bring a child into the world, which is full of uncertainties and they may not have such a beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful future. So, so one may not want to bring, bring a child out into the world in that direction. So it can have such an effect as well. So I'm going to stop here. That, as I said, that there's many things to be done. And I thought, um, I just started my ESG project that look at the impact of climate change on population dynamics, because I want to understand, sort of linking a bit with Anne's work as well, so to try and understand how future population would look like. Do we need to account for the impact of climate change on the population or not? So my um, project aims to look at how climate change would affect fertility, mortality, and migration, and then put all the empirical evidence together and try to formulate that how would, do we need to account for these changes um, into our population protection. So I just want to say that we don't, we don't have the, the, the conclusion. My guess is climate change may suppress fertility, uh, but uh, I, I have, uh, I have four, four years and a half now to, to complete this project. I'm going to stop here. Thank you. I can stop sharing the okay. screen as well. So, do we have questions? Um, so, I think uh, lunch uh, is uh, <laughs> approaching. Huh? So, uh, yes, Sun has a question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mutarak. Uh, great, uh, great talk. Um, I would, uh, I wanted to ask about the, um, the institution, the role of institution. So obviously you're thinking that, that uh, institution players don't have such a role in influencing fertility. And, but we know like what killed um, the fertility from the ICPD in 94 was actually the Catholic Church who put a veto on saying like, okay, we don't touch how uh, people do have children and how they, they will. So do you think this has changed? So like, is there, um, so not only governments having an influence, but like uh, all of our institutions surrounding, what do you think? Thank you. You know, I, thanks, and I keep on referring you in my talk. <laughs> so, um, no, 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 certainly. I, I, I think I, I was a bit silent on the institution, but it's certainly one part of, of, of the drivers. But now, uh, since the narratives have, have changed a bit, you know, the institution, I think if you think of the Chinese government, for instance, or the think of foreign government, the Korean government that tried to promote higher fertility with all sorts of incentives, we know that it doesn't quite work because, okay, on the one side to make people have more children, you cannot really, at least in, 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 in the current world that we live in, and we hopefully it's not gonna happen in the future in a kind of dystopian world that you cannot coerce people to make children. So institutions play a role in a certain 
uh, extend in in, in um, making incentives, but but how much? It's, but on another side of, of suppressing fertility, I think um, because we we have human rights, we have reproductive rights. I I think in, in in that sense that it has been done in the past as the, the church went around and then. Uh, promoting or, or almost causing sterilization in certain countries, it's not or at least nowadays, it's not an automation. But I think institutions play the indirect role, but we think the policy that we, we have seen in place, it doesn't hit the target. That's how I see it. I see that you cannot tell the people that I, I give a 200 euro more per month and then to, 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 to give the child care incentive because if people don't have job, they're not gonna have children. Okay, thank you. So I have a question. So um, you show this figure that the, um, is uh, a result that the, uh, the highest uh, impact on climate change is having one baby more. Uh, so I, I was wondering uh, whether this refers to developed countries or to developing countries, or it's a uniform effect so what the, what what that paper used is very um, exactly which is referred to to so they did a kind of a systematic literature review taking the um, the evidence so they quantify how much the carbon footprint is is, is uh, that that you can calculate but it's only developed countries and if you read the paper they also break down to different developed countries and in, in that sense the the US <laughs> if because they're living in the US and not having a child would even reduce uh, more of the carbon emission compared to a person in Japan with consumption of solar is in that way. Uh, okay. Uh, what do you expect uh, the result would be in uh, developing uh, in developing countries? Um, I, I don't have the number on the top of my head, which I should have. Uh, I think that the total emissions now is uh, from, from Africa is probably in the, in the global emission, probably Africa contributes what about five percent, or, or at most maybe ten percent. So, so surely it's going to be lower. Now, the some people also argue that yeah, you, you demographers you tend to say that maybe population size only is not the only problem, but we have also taken into account that Africa is also take the wall out because that that interrupt everything. It's also getting also at least in the trajectory of getting richer and consumption will change. But still, one could also think that if consumption pattern would change in lower income countries, probably it's unlikely that, that everyone's going to have a big car washing machine, dishwasher, like, like the way we have. So I still think that um, we could still be lower in, in many contexts. Yeah. And, and hopefully, and I think it is urgent that we, we really need to change the way we consume uh, renewable energy, but also other things that the consumption pattern change. Thank you. So I see no other questions. So thank you very much again, Raya, uh, for this very interesting talk. And um, so we stop here and uh, reconvene at uh, 2 p.m. Okay. Thank you and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>